Come here. Come closer. <laughs> Brackis is back. <laughs> After over than three years from one of the YouTube's saddest moments, <laughs> the legendary channel Brackis is back. So I invite you to react to the comeback video together with me because there is a lot of things to talk about that, including the new engine that they are going to use in their upcoming tutorials. So three years ago, we were left with this message from Brackies. The world. But of course, all good things must come to an end. And while I'm in love with game development and it's been amazing creating all this content over the years, I just checked we've made like 460 videos. It's time to take a step back and see what other fun stuff there is to try. So the video so ends. What does like that mean? This. Thanks for watching. Heartbreaking, guys. I want to cry. <laughs> and well, after that, they kept with some game jams because they have a community game jam that they kept on during this period. And also, uh, after Unity's latest <laughs> flaws. They made a commentary, they made a comment upon this, making their, their statement. I'll put a link in the description so you guys can check this out. This is a very good statement um, upon what Unity did with the new pricing policies. But now, <laughs> now guys, here comes the, the light in the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Yesterday, they made this video, which is the one that we are going to react right now. So let's get started. So yeah, let's watch the video. <laughs> I love his energy. I've been thinking of something that I could say to try and break the ice. But I think I'll just go ahead and do it. <laughs> the puns. <laughs> the master of puns. All right, now that's out of the way. Hello, everyone. It's been a while. I hope you've all been well. The last time we uploaded a video was over three years ago. Yeah, and I think it's safe to say that a lot has happened since then, both in the world and in the game dev industry. Personally, Especially. I've been taking a break from video games. And to be honest, I wasn't really planning on making any new videos anytime soon. I think for a while that some of the harsh realities of the video game industry had taken away some of the joy that I used to feel when making games. Yeah. From the lack of unionization in AAA to the real challenge of keeping an indie game studio afloat, I think there's an ever increasing... Yeah, so this is something that we've already talked about here in the channel. I'll put the, the video in the cards. But yeah, the game development industry has been through some harsh times. So you can see 38 days into 2024 and over the 6,400 oh, 6, people lost their jobs already. So it's, yeah, it's pretty bumming. But yeah, we have to deal with that because as I said in the video, these people are going to... to create their own studios, they are going to work for other indie game studios. So they are now in the market competing with us. So we have to deal with that because they know how to make games and they know how to games make games professionally. So we have to, to come out with a solution for that. Pressure on developers. As someone who started in the game dev space very young with simple and probably naive ideas of what it means to make video games, these realities simply took it out of me for a while. But recently, that changed a bit. Not because I discovered some cure that will magically make these issues disappear. Because unfortunately, I haven't. And they won't. But simply because I saw something that made me excited about making games again. In fact, you could say that it's been a game changer, pun intended. And I know that a lot of you feel the same. I'm of course talking about open source. Let me explain. I've long been... A yeah, so this is something... Let me, let me put my, my two cents here. Ever since I was in the college, so on, on my graduation for a game development degree, um, game design degree actually, uh, this was something that I was already seeing because back then I started working with GIMP, Blender, LMMS, and well, we, we had to work with Game Maker and Unity, but I always saw those open source tools. They have a lot of potential because it, it was not something like technical or anything like that. It's about the foundations of open source because if you have something open that people can contribute, the more people that you have on the project and the more users that you have using your product, the better it becomes. And the, 
the more things that you can solve, the more issues that are going to come out and some corn cases, corner cases that you can fix and people are going to come out with improvements for your tool. So it always makes sense for me to have open source tools. And a small uh, trivia about that, a small uh, curiosity about that, most of the top of the tip of the market industries for like music or movie, especially movie, if you go to to Hollywood and see the software that they use there are mostly open source because many studios can split the cost of improving this of improving these tools and they can all get the benefits of the, the, the of the improvements that were made. So they can make something like a font and put some money into this font and found some new features or improvements to their tools. So most of the tools on this tip of the market industries uh, or companies are open source or they use open source. So we have Linux on Android, for instance, or, or many other things. I think that we ha have Linux. Linux is the most used uh, OS in the planet. People just don't realize that. But also Tesla, I, I would try to find the, the news that talk about that, but Tesla uses Grow for the, uh, especially for the the interface, the user interface of the cars. So this is huge, this is massive, right? So this is something that I always talk, talk about, I thought about, is that open source makes more sense. It has more foundations. Uh, and also, if you've been following me, you know that I am a libertarian anarchist, so I don't believe in intellectual property. On the other hand, I am all in for private property, but intellectual property makes no sense. We are not going into that in this video. Uh, I think that we have a video plan for the next week in which I explain why I don't support proprietary, many quotes marks here, software because it, it makes no sense. And on the other hand, free and open source. I don't see any problem into selling open source tools. You can do pretty much what you, you want with them. But just having the source code open for people to improve it or at least understand what the tool actually does is one foundational thing that will make open source reliable and more uh, more solid solutions for all many problems that we have currently in the software industry but let's go back to the video i'm a huge fan of blender if you don't know blender is an incredibly powerful and now very popular yeah. 3d graphics tool it has capabilities in modeling, so, sculpt. When I was in, in college, my my teacher was trying to convince us to use 3ds Max and Maya, and many people uh, went to to these solutions. But I and back then my girlfriend also, we preferred to use Blender. It, it always made more sense to us. This was like ten or or more years. Uh, ago but yeah blender was always better for us and i i could always think about the ways that blender work uh were always better and i think that i talked about that with nathan as well because nathan has uh, <laughs> we had a discussion about that because i told him like guru will be the blender of game engines and he was like, no, Godot is very small still and stuff like this. And back then in 2017, I was like, no, Godot will be the, the Blender for game engines because it, it has the same foundation, uh, the same foundation features, being open source, being community driven and stuff like this. So it always makes sense for me. Opting, UV mapping, hugely powerful rendering, and the list just goes on. And the thing about Blender is that it's 100% free. <laughs> oh when I started so this is a a very weak argument in favor of open source software because yeah people usually advocate for yeah let's use open source this tool because it's free I can understand that when you have a studio and you have to pay for like three thousand dollars for a license for one person and if you have like 10 
or more people working with this tool. This makes a lot of sense. Uh, but when you talk about open source software, this is by far one of the weakest things. Yeah, it's free. So what? The, the thing is that it's library. So you are also able to use the source code and improve the tool and change it and modify it as you need. So you can take the source code and make it basically your own. But let's go back to the video. Using Blender was still pretty small and not even close to comparing to the mighty industry standard Autodesk suite. But yeah. since then, it has become a huge contender in the world of 3D graphics, preferred by many professionals as well. Yeah, especially can... if you don't know about that, Blender is being used ma massively in ma uh, anime industry. So, on in Japan, for instance, Blender is used among many studios. So, people are making um, animes animes with Blender basically and it's growing on, on popularity as well. Something that is free ever compete with a hugely complicated software suite that costs thousands of dollars in subscription fees? Well at least part of the answer is that Blender is what we call free and open source software, also yeah. known as is the Is the open source software thing that actually makes Blender really strong? Us. This means that instead of a company owning and controlling the software with a private code base, the software is publicly owned and has a public and open code base that anyone can access and contribute to. If you don't like something about the software or you would like to add a feature to it, you can simply download a copy of it and modify it to suit your needs. Or fix a bug or make some quality of life improvements. Yeah, as I said in the previous video, guys, 1500 contributions. <laughs> this is this is a lot. It's and then if you like the result, you can re-upload it to see if other people would find yeah, it useful the, too. The Perhaps merging results. your changes into the main program. One of the great benefits of this is that it helps ensure that the software development is driven so, by the Yeah, think about it for a second. If you are a game development uh, studio and you use Grot Engine, for instance, and you have like some in-house programmers or engineers, engineers, you can basically change the the um, the engine to your needs. And if you want to, you can basically make some PRs, making public all your improvements. So this makes a lot of sense because, for instance, you can do that with Unity. I remember that one of the things that I, one of the problems that I had with Unity was that I was trying to make some node system and uh, the drawing of lines was bugged we have a bug into the, the drawing of some lines that were connecting the the nodes and i and i think that i um i had the solution to, to implement it and i make a ticket to get the unit support and they say yeah we are aware of that but we are not going to work with this because this is not a priority right now and i think that until these days i can i can bet on that they didn't fix this issue. But yeah, if I had the access to the source code, I could make this improvement and maybe prevent people from all over the world to hit into the same uh, bug that I that I faced. So this is something that open source can do. And imagine thousands and thousands of, of studios making the same thing. They take a tool, an open source tool, they put on the production line, they face some problems, they make some improvements, and then they make some pushes, they make some PRs back into the, the engine or the tool itself, the tool uh, code base. And with all these studios working together, they are working independently, but they are unaware that they are working together. The tool itself becomes better for everyone. So this is the magic of open source. And the needs of the people who use it. It's a hugely democratic way of organizing development. On top of this, open source makes it possible to utilize volunteer work and donations to fund development. This means that the software is free from ties to any single entity and makes it possible for anyone to use it without Yeah, this is another thing. So if you think about, for instance, Godot Engine, right? We had some investment on Godot 3 from Microsoft and from Mozilla, and both are were unaware of the investment, but both benefit from the investment of each other so when you have something that is open that no company actually owns it uh all companies can make their own investment and pay for work to implement something that 
is necessary for them to actually reach their goals. So for instance, Microsoft makes some investments to implement C Sharp on Growth, and Mozilla made some investments to make it more reliable on uh, on web exports. But everyone ben benefits from, from that. So this is another amazing thing from uh, open source tools. Everyone can contribute, and if you don't know how to code, you can pay someone to code it for you. So I remember that there was a platform, Bounty Source, I think that this was the name, that you can basically put a bounty on a, a feature request or a bug fix or something like that and allow other programmers or engineers or stuff like this or designers to solve this for you. So this is amazing, right? So it's basically like... I can improve this tool even though I don't know how to actually make this improvement. I can basically just ask and put a bounty and people will try to make it for me and I will pay them for, to do that. So it's another another thing that really makes open source uh, amazing to, to work with. Having to pay subscription fees or owing away part of their revenue. And open source is actually not as niche as you might think. Linux, for example, went from a small hobbyist tool in the early 90s to powering enterprise server systems. Also, yeah. so many of the completely mainstream products of our time are built on top of Linux, such as software for cars, televisions, and all Android phones. It also powers most of the internet and the world's stock exchanges. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is another thing. Uh, Linux is behind most of the stock exchange uh, bots and other operational uh, computing. So Linux is very, very, um, popular on this kind of market. Open source is already an integral part of the digital world we live in today. Definitely. Now I mentioned that I started making games when I was still very young, but looking back it feels like the industry was as well. In just the past decade, third-party engines like Unity and Unreal have become huge and industry standard. A big difference from before, where game studios would develop and use their own in-house engines. Yeah, All this is something very interesting to, to think about because Previously, and there is not many, this is not many years ago, previously most developers use their own engine, right? So this is a co culture that is still underground here nowadays, but previously people just did their own engine or they used like something like Flash or stuff like this. And nowadays uh, these engines, these 30 party engines are basically industry standards. This is pretty, pretty huge. So, indie development has gone from something that very few people even knew about to a huge community where hobbyists and professionals alike publish successful game titles, largely because of how accessible these third-party engines have become. And the game industry as a whole has become the largest entertainment industry in the world, far yes, surpassing yeah. music and movies put together. Now, this is a lot of change. Put together. So, game industry is more profitable at, at least uh, at least in rough numbers is more it it has more revenue than the movie and the music industries together <laughs> this is massive i didn't know about that i didn't uh, i didn't know about that and not in a lot of time and while huge growth like this of course creates issues i think it's important to remember that it also brings a lot of positives perhaps most importantly making games yeah, has this never is thing, this is something that uh, we don't understand yet because many other industries they have a steady growth so for instance a movie movies and music they have a steady flow of resources and we can see a steady growth on these industries but game development and especially indie game development we have those spikes right so we have a spike on 28 or 20 yeah 2008 uh, we have on 20, 2011, 2016, and another spike now, uh, 2020, right? So during the, the pandemic. And we don't have a steady growth. We just have something like a bump and another bump and another bump. We, we don't have consistency in this industry. So we just kept, <laughs> keep growing basically <laughs> on those, those spikes. And we, we should really think about that. But anyway, let's go back to the video. It's never been more accessible than it is now. And also, large open source projects like a modern game engine require a lot of manpower to develop. Something that wouldn't have been possible with the small game dev communities of just 10 years ago. In oh, fact, man. <laughs> yeah, 
this is so nostalgic. Yeah, let's go back to this. Yeah, I really remember playing out with Blender Game Engine, guys. This is oh, it, it had some pretty cool uh, interface, so we could use those nodes to. We have something like sensors and controllers, and then actors, something like this, uh, actuator. Yeah, and it was very cool because this made a lot of sense to me, but it it was just no sense because it, it was not very powerful when, when we we couldn't do a lot of things especially because blender's built-in uh engine uh physics engine was just not very good uh and i think that this the blender game engine was made to make those um uh real time um physics simulations so it, it was not actually made for games but anyway Thing that wouldn't have been possible with the small game dev communities of just 10 years ago. In fact, just before taking a break from game dev, I was aware of a few open source initiatives, but I didn't think that they were viable alternatives to commercial engines. But holy wow, a lot has happened since to convince me otherwise. And huge props to the game dev community for making that happen. First of all, a bunch of new engines have popped up. Publishing agnostic. What's that? Own publishing destination. What? Do oh, okay. So you have a platform that you should publish on, right? So I think that this is what he meant to to be or to say. Uh, yeah, a lot of game engines right here. Up and just like with Blender, previously niche software is starting to gain massive followings, with many contributing their time and donating to hire full-time developers. The largest example of this being Godot. Godot is a free and fully open source awesome. game engine that a lot of developers <laughs> have recently turned to. And the timing so this really is something that, yeah, this was what I was talking with Nathan back then. Godot will become the blender of game engines. There is no, no way around that. So when I first saw, I don't know if you know about those MEBTI personalities. I have, I, I don't, I think that I have INTJ or a ENTJ personality. I think that is in ENTJ because INTJs are <laughs> usually just conspiracy theorists. Theorist. Uh, so the thing is, we have a function called introverted intuition on a on the top of our stack functions. Um, and introverted intuition is all about looking for patterns that and how they will unfold in the future, right? So. When I see, for instance, Bitcoin or Blender or Linux or Grow, I can see that the, the foundations that were there would bring a good fu future for these tools. So I could look at them and see, hey, this will be massive in the future. Nathan, on the other hand, he has, I think, a ISTJ personality. So he has uh, introverted sensing on the, his top uh the top of his function stack so introverted sensing is all about we need previous pro proofs if this works or not we need a history of things working so we can take decisions so they need concrete observations from the past to take action to to actually imagine the possibilities that they can do with things based on previous es experiences and well introverted intuition is the other way around that so introverted intuition is we don't have any proof that this will work but we have the the current state of things and i think that based on how things are now they will unfold this way in the future but yeah we don't actually always get things right but we have this ability to foresee things actually uh, especially things um the personalities like infj they are known for making those predictions very well so the, the thing is, when I saw Godot, I, I knew that it would just be massive in the future. I think that it didn't actually reach 10% of its potential. Maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe 30% of the potential. But yeah, I think that Godot has still a long way to go. Uh, and it will become the, the main tool for game development in the future, in the near future, actually. It would be better for this. Godot has actually been around for a while, but in March last year, Godot 4 was what released. What game is that? Game engine? Godot has actually been around for a while. 
source. Yeah, good old Indian. What 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 game is that? It's beautiful. Love it. Well, but in March last year, Godot 4 was released, which was a huge rewrite. Yeah, it's, it's cool right? how we can just look at things and imagine how we can do that in Godot. Well, so but in I March saw this. Yeah, you see a, a laser on this, uh, hitting this, these enemies. And last I can year, think, yeah, I think that they use a ray cast and a line to the... <laughs> Godot 4 was released, cool which was a huge rewrite of the engine, in my eyes, making it a great choice for a lot of game projects. And of course, Godot is now riding on a wave of new users, developers, and a huge influx of donations to the Godot Development Fund. I've been toying around with it for the past few months, <laughs> and I've been, well, loving it. Well, many parts of the yeah, engine, of course, of course you do. Godot is so intuitive. It, everything makes sense. That yeah, most of the things makes make sense in Godot, and the composition approach is way better than game objects approach. So we can make uh, a subset. You can make something like nested, uh, nested scenes, nested nodes, and stuff like this. Whereas Unity just doesn't make a lot of sense to have like game component and make the game object with many components. This just doesn't work very intuitively. Of course, have a ways to go. It is overall much further than I was expecting. And perhaps more importantly for me, it forced me to learn new things and reminded me of why I fell in love with making games in the first place. <laughs> cool. Now, as for the title of this video, I'm of course in no position to predict the future of the huge industry that now is game development. But I do think that part of making that future the best that it can be is to realize just that. Game development is huge now. And while this of course brings a lot of negatives, it also means that there are more game developers than ever before, who all share a love for the same thing. And that perhaps a part of this future is software that is open source, democratically owned and community funded. Now I want- Yeah, this is what I was talking about. So by splitting the cost of making a better engine, making a better software, making better tools and splitting this cost among users so we can make these improvements and studios can make these improvements by sponsoring the, the engine or the tool and everyone can make those those improvements and making uh, founding some some PRs or some requests or some bug fixes. We can reach the, <laughs> the ultimate tool for making games that is just this is the thing, when we have open source things and people are collaborating into these open source tools, we are going to pass the proprietary tools because it's just plain numbers. Uh, there's just a limited amount of people that can work on Unreal or Unity or let's say Autodesk stuff, but there is no hard limit for people that can work on Grow or Blender or Krita or Inkscape. So, People that the more users that you have, the more people that are using these tools, the more people contributing contributing to the, these tools we have, and the more people contributing to these tools, the better they become. So this is pretty logical, right? So this is what I'm talking about uh, when we, I was talking about open source tools. The the foundations of them just makes just make a lot of sense. Is it, it doesn't even compare to the foundations of like licensing a, a software or having like subscription based revenue uh this just doesn't make sense you, you can make this work for very long anyway let's go back to, to the video i want to be totally clear here i'm by no means encouraging you to stop using third-party engines like unity unreal or game maker well, I am. Just stop using them and go all in in Godot engine. Nor am I saying that you should all use Godot or any other. I am. I always use Godot. Other open source engine for that matter. I've been using Unity for many years and made well over 400 videos on it. So it's safe to say that I like the software. In the end, a game engine is a tool, and you have to use the tool that is right for you and your project. All I hope to do with yeah, this video is to sense. inform you okay. that there are many engines out there and hopefully to inspire you to think of the possibilities of what can be achieved through different ways of organizing software. At GDC last year, one of the co-founders of the Godot engine, Juan Denetsky, gave a talk titled Godot as an open ecosystem with a lot of sharp observations about open source in the game dev industry. It goes into detail about how open source can be yeah, beneficial. This is, this is what I'm talking about. So you can split the costs and uh, the, the cost of making the software better among the users and just 
make things uh, happen, right? For the industry as a whole, yeah. and I highly recommend you check it out. So, in the spirit of open source, we'll be releasing some new notice, videos. Uh, yeah, he, he has now a, a earring and his ear is very red. So I think that that is a information <laughs> on Godot. I've been hard at work learning the engine, and while I'm no expert yet, and things are a bit different this time around, there's no team, there are no patron supporters, we aren't in an office, in fact, we're recording this from Al our almost home. Almost from the beginning, right? So they, they, I? Just have, they just have a million subscribers. <laughs> With the help okay. of Sophia, have done our best to create a couple of videos on the most essential parts of Godot. The first video will be a mega tip. <laughs> this is pretty Couple cool. Of videos so on the most essential is, parts of Godot. The first video. This is a reference. I don't know if this is what is, if the, the documentation is still using this reference, but this <laughs> this reference here is a reference to the documentation in the the Godot documentation where we have a an analogy that using nodes and resources w was like cooking. So nodes are tools and resources are the well the resources right so the, um, the ingredients and you can basically just bake them using good engine so this is a very cool reference i i will look in the documentation if we still have this this reference because it was a cook cooking and and they explaining the the philosophy behind Godot's design video will be a mega tutorial on making your very first game in Godot and should be out next week. The nice. second one will be next, a... Com next week. Next week we are where we have some Godot tutorials on brackets. Damn. Complete Amazing. overview of the GD script language and will be out within a month. Yeah, I'm very happy that they are going to use uh, GD script because GD script makes more sense, especially for newcomers, but GD script is just faster to create things and to prototype and to make. I would advocate that you should actually use Godot or GD script throughout your whole project. But if you want to, you can just use C++ to make some improvements on performance if this is necessary. So don't do premature optimizations. This is a huge, a massive killer in the in the game development industry because people are not making games trying to figure out optimization for things that they didn't know if will be necessary yet so if players if users don't comply don't complain about your game not being optimized you shouldn't either don't complain don't try to to find solutions for things that are not a problem yet just make a game release it and you can always, you can always optimize it later. So that's say, let's go back to the video. We really can't wait to share them with you. And we thought that cool. since so many things are different this time around, we might as well try something new. So the new videos will be in Danish. <laughs> what do you think, guys? O que, que vocês acham de eu começar a fazer tutoriais em português? <risos> Vou seguir a trend aqui e vou começar a fazer tutoriais em, em português. Deixa os comentários aí para ver o que, que vocês acham sobre isso. Hej alle e bem-vindos ao nosso primeiro vídeo sobre Godot. E nesse vídeo vamos ver se você pode ver muitos... Sim, mas... Você pode ver que você pode fazer isso em danês? Sim, eu acho que você pode fazer isso em danês. Eu acho que você pode fazer isso em danês. Em danês? Hello everyone and welcome to our first video on Godot. <laughs> the hype! <laughs> the hype is real guys, yeah. So next week we are going to have a tutorial, a Godot tutorial on brackets already. So <laughs> this is amazing. So I I didn't find the the this series of videos that actually inspired me because my first series on my channel here in Pig Dev channel was a series inspired by this series from Brackies, a, a quiz game. I did it in Portuguese, but yeah, I think that this was the reason why I deleted the, the videos because I want to kept just the, um, the English ones. But yeah, it's very cool that they are going, they are coming back, they are going to create content again, and especially they are going to create good content. So this is amazing. So. That's it. This was my reaction video. I hope you enjoy it. Please leave some comments, some feedback so I can so I know what you think about that. But that's it. Thank you so much for watching. 
keep developing, and until the next time, see you there.